So yeah. This is No Grounds for Fictional Fictionalism by Robert Knowles in Phil Studies. And uh, yeah. So hopefully we'll get through this fast. So yeah, as always, ask questions, let me know, and feel free to ask whatever you want. And, and uh, as always, we can go on tangents if we've got other stuff. But yeah, that Wi-Fi thing is really impressive. All right, so let's get through this one because I want to get one more paper read. And uh, then we'll be off after that. Introduction. The grounding relation is supposed to be a distinctive relation of non-causal determination that supports metaphysical explanation. Okay, yeah, just so you guys know, if someone says we're going to ground something in philosophy, we're giving, we're giving an explanation on the metaphysical level. Like, why is, like, you know, whatever. Like, why why is there gravity? Well, it's, like, based in, like, the structure of space-time. That's a grounding explanation uh, in the metaphysics of how, like, what we experience of gravity is how it is represented in physics okay realists argue that positing it allows us to among other things appreciate the commonality among various more specific non-causal determination relations understand what is involved in metaphysical explanations define important notions such as fundamentality and state philosophical theses at a fortuitous level of grain ugh do the grounds ground the grounds um only if you're drinking coffee valpo uh more technically there are ungrounded things like in Aristotle the unmoved mover they'd be the ungrounded grounds you can have self grounding things things that are somehow like dependent on themselves people have come up with lots of uh, bullshit things but yes uh, yeah they can they or they may or they may not depending on your system okay but yeah we're talking about fiction hopefully we'll get past the grounding stuff to fictionalism which is more interesting to me Realists hold that positing grounds helps to us to understand better the structure of reality and our cogni cognition of it via explanation. Yeah, so like, look, basically grounding for, if we don't make fun of it, is trying to do a generalized version of explanation. What is the more generalized version of an explanation? It's a grounding. It's like you're grounding some like high level thing that we want to discuss, like, um, like how we get through the world in something more fundamental like physics, in theory. All right. Illimitivists dispute the, all, these benefits and prescribe that we demur from grounding talk altogether. For example, Wilson highlights the importance of the very specific non-causal relations of determination, so mere logical parthood, type token, functional realization, and determinate determinable relations. Yeah, so basically people are like, no, let's not do grounding. So that's this is the uh, don't don't go into grounding talk because it's all bullshit. If you try to reduce everything down to something more fundamental, there's a lot of interesting things going on and argues that positing grounding in addition gets in the way of good metaphysics. Other eliminativists claim that the notion of grounding is unintelligible. And this is like very reasonable position. You say, screw this. We're not going to try to ground everything all at once. We have to talk about actually what is going on in the world. Author says, the dialectic here is familiar. In many ontological disputes, realists lean on the theoretical benefits of positing a kind of entity, while anti-realists dispute those benefits or highlight the costs of the posit. In situations like this, a popular anti-realist anti move is to adopt fictionalism, on which sentences concerning the relevant kind of entity are strictly untrue, but treating them as though they are true beings all the... Are, uh, Though treating them as though they are true brings all the benefits the realist could want. Fictionalism offers a halfway house between realism and eliminativism. Yeah, and see, this is why it's interesting. You're not saying you're going to reduce everything down to nothing, and you're not going to say everything is, like, unique on its own. You're saying, look, there is the grounding stuff, but it's strictly false. Okay, thanks to Thompson, grounding fictionalism is now officially on the table. Thompson defends hermeneutic fictionalism on which sentences about grounding are actually used non-literally non to convey claims about what metaphysically explains what. But there is also a nearby revolutionary proposal on which sentences about grounding are actually used literally to communicate about grounding, but should be used non-literally to communicate about metaphysical explanation. Okay, so it's doing double duty here. Despite the apparent dialectical kinship with other debates where fictionalism has a healthy tradition, I claim that the situation with, with respect to grounding talk is different in two key respects. First, grounding talk is not indispensable, nor even particularly convenient as a means of communicating about metaphysical explanation. 
Secondly, talk about grounding primarily occurs within metaphysics, which means the usual options for motivating a literal and non-literal interpretation are ineffective. These differences remove motivation for the revolutionary, revolutionary and hermeneutic proposals, respectively. A cautionary note before continuing. Thompson's proposal, and my criticisms of it, are premised on the assumption that grounding is an ontological posit. This assumption is not universally shared even within the mainstream of grounding theory. One prominent theory de declines to posit a grounding relation, but retains the notion of grounding as what is expressed by sentient connectives like because and in virtue of, or some formal language counterpart thereof. Such connective theorists are neither realists nor eliminativists. There may be a further problem for Thompson here. The availability of non-revisionary, ontologically innocent approaches to grounding may lessen the appeal of fictionalism. However, I set this complication aside in what follows. All right, I'm sorry, I did not know I was going to be doing all metaphysics here. I was hoping we'd talk about fictionalism without talking about grounding, but it looks like we've got a grounding paper again. Okay, so... Feel free to ask me questions about grounding. I don't know if I'll be able to answer them, but I know this stuff is like in the weeds. Like, how do we actually give abstract explanations? What is it to give an explanation? What is it for one thing to be metaphysically grounded into another? I know. It's complicated and a little silly at times. All right. Two. Against revel... Yeah, and on the up side, we're almost halfway through the paper already. <laughs> Two. Against revolutionary fictionalism. The central challenge for fictionalism is to answer the following question. Why engage in talk that is systematically untrue? The fictionalist must, be, must show how the relevant senses can be used for something valuable enough to be worth it. The answer to this challenge can be relied upon to explain why people use the senses of the discourse in this way for hermeneutical purposes or to urge that they should use them in this way for a revolutionary proposal. I focus on the revolutionary fictionalism in this section. Yes, yeah, like if you're a fictionalist, you have to say, look, everything I'm saying is wrong, but it's very useful. It's a useful wrong. This happens a lot. And I mean, it happens a lot, lot. Like you say, look, I know I'm not technically right, but. All right. Author says for brevity and concreteness, let the pro proper relata of the grounding relation be facts, according to the story. Let the predicate X ground Y mean that X partially grounds Y, where Y may have other grounds as well. And if A is declarative sentence, let uh, square bracket A be the fact that A and trying uh, angle bracket A be the proposition that A. Okay, so basically, look, if something grounds something else, like a lot of things are grounded in physics or, you know, like uh, I'm sitting in this room. That can be grounded in the fact that I'm in the room and I'm sitting on this chair or it could be also that my physical body is physically arranged in a certain way and that's what it is so you can think of like there's different ways of thinking about uh how you can describe the same facts so okay drawing on Yablo and thompson uh argues that grounding senses can be used non-literally to communicate about to communicate about what metaphysically explains what on this view trump exists grounds the fact that the object trump exists Literally expresses the false proposition, okay, that you've got like different groupings of things when Trump exists, because that's not really an object, grounds the fact that the object Trump exists. However, it can be used non-literally to explain to convey the true proposition that Trump exists, metaphysically explains that the thing, Trump, the <laughs> the uh, sentence Trump exists. All right, so you're talking about sentences are grounded in the facts that the objects exists. So it's like you can talk about one thing, like the sentence, while you're actually not talking about the object sometimes. Sometimes you can say, like, the fact that the sentence is true does not actually depend only on all the objects within it being true. It may be, like, you know, you're talking about uh, two different things, the sentences and then the way the world is. Sometimes the sentence doesn't line up with the world, but you can describe the world in a way that does tell you that the sentence is true, which is maybe what you wanted to talk about. Okay, so one sentence is true if and only if uh, the content that's like the object in the world uh, of one or more specific metaphysical determinate relations uh, determine the thing. And two, this suffices for Trump existing to explain the fact of the sentence that Trump exists. Like, so this is what we're talking about. The fact that the man exists explains why the sentence Trump exists is true. We know that Trump bears some set membership to the, you know, set of Trump. 
Yeah, exactly. I'm sorry, Viper. I, I did not know this is what I was getting myself into. I apologize. Yeah, and everyone's gone. Like, most people are out of here. I'm like, yep, bye. <laughs> oh, well. So, for 401, this is uh, basically... Yeah, this is part for the course. I tried to get a little lucky on what I was reading, and roulette bit me. That's why it's roulette. Okay. So, we know that Trump bears set membership to the set of Trump, and we know that sets iteratively conceived depend for their existence on their members, so one and two are plausibly satisfied. Yeah, so if you're talking about the object and then the set of the object, like, that's what you're talking about with the set is grounded in the actual object, so... Okay, more generally, we, when we are tempted to say that A grounds B, there will usually be a specific relation of metaphysical determination relating the contents of A and the contents of B in such a way that is sufficient for A to explain B. So there is a systematic mapping of literally false grounding sentences to truths about what metaphysically explains what, that those sentences can be used, that, that those sentences can be used non-literally to convey. So you're talking about the objects and then the sentences that talk about the objects. This goes some way towards answering the central challenge. The grounding fiction is useful because it can be used to convey truths about what metaphysically grounds, what metaphysically explains what. But this benefit must be good enough to be worth using grounding talk over a much more direct way of speaking. In other debates where fictionalism has a healthy tradition, it is often claimed that the fiction rewards speakers with expressive benefits. For example, Diablo argues that a num that number talk can be used non-literally to express physical co uh, physical content that would otherwise be difficult to express. For example, suppose I'm sharing some crisps with someone, and due to an overactive sense of justice, I eat one crisp for every crisp my friend eats, and no more. I eventually lose count of how many crisps were we have eaten, but I know that neither of us has eaten more than the other. I might try to express this by saying, my friend has eaten no crisps and I have eaten no crisps, and I have eaten no crisps, or my friend has eaten one crisp and I have eaten one crisp, and so on ad infinitum. This has the benefit of directness. I mention only the things I intended to communicate about. The drawback is that I will never finish what I am trying to say. Number talk to the rescue. My friend and I have eaten the same number of crisps. With this crisp formulation, I have communicated everything I wanted to without having to go on and on about it. In this way, number talk regiments and enhances our communication about physical things throughout ordinary and scientific language, and that seems like a good reason to engage in it, even if it is literally untrue. And notice, if you're saying, my friend and I have eaten the exact same number of crisps, that is a technically false statement because over the course of your life, you have not eaten the exact same number of crisps. Well, you might want to say at this time and in this exact way, but then you're, again, not being, uh, you're being overly specific and then you would have to specify everything you're saying and that's what you don't want to do. But like, So you're saying something technically false when you say, my friend and I have eaten the same number of crisps, but that gets the idea across even though it's technically false. Okay. Thompson clearly has this kind of story in mind. It is simpler to talk in terms of grounding than it would be to talk in terms of a disjunction of metaphysically dependent relations and the system of metaphysical explanations we impose on them. Yes, yeah, if you try to actually give a whole metaphysics, it's complicated. But the idea is that you're simplifying by talking about this grounds that. This metaphysically explains that. Engagement in the grounding fiction imposes a kind of regimentation on discourse about metaphysical explanation. Talking in terms of grounding is indeed simpler than talking in terms of a, a disjunction of metaphysical dependence relations. This is most obvious in situations where the specific relations involved elude us. For example, one may be convinced that I am in physical state X is metaphysically explanatory of I am in pain, but I have no idea how contents of the former determine the contents of the latter. It is tempting to think that we can either painstakingly say my tokening of the type X is identical to my tokening of the type pain or the kind X is identical to the kind pain or my being in X is in some way is, 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 is one of many ways of realizing the functional type of being in pain and then go on to say that the truth of any one of these disjuncts is sufficient for I am in X to be explanatory of I am in pain or just I am in physical state X grounds I am in pain non-literally. Yeah, because this is the thing. How specific do you have to be about any one pain? So, like, if you are dis discussing pain, you say, well, I'm in pain. Well, what e what exact pain is that? And then, like, you have to get more specific about it, but you're never going to be able to describe anything perfectly in terms of philosophy or in terms of your own life. So, it's just, like, 
you have to be general in some sense. And so you might technically be saying something false always. That's fictionalism. This is why I want to read the paper is because, uh, Dagnabbit. Okay. So this is part of the thing. It's just, uh, stop sending me messages. Sorry. So th this is why I wanted to, like, I thought we'd be talking about things that we could say were false, but it'd be more interesting. But instead we got ourselves into a grounding paper again. Okay. But still, you can see the point as like, look, if you have all these metaphysical theories, you say, look, look, none of them matter. We're just saying this metaphysically grounds that that's it. And it simplifies, uh, the philosophy. And that's the whole point of talking about grounding. You say, well, maybe it's not exactly right, but it simplifies the whole thing. All right. But if this is our choice, it would indeed be fortuitous to engage in the grounding fiction. But this is a false dilemma. There is another direct literal locution that is exactly appropriate for the situation. We can just say I am in physical state X metaphysically explains I am in pain. More generally, I offer the following schematic advice. Instead of A grounds B, we say A metaphysically explains B. I mean, do we need relevant XKCD here? Like every time someone wants to give a new term or new standard, then we just have one more standard. Why is saying metaphysically explains any better than saying grounds or vice versa for that matter? I mean, seriously, just one more standard. Is that it? I mean, author says the initial draw of grounding fictionalism stems from the fact that in cases where a grounds B is fictional, there'll be one or more specific metaphysically determinate relations, determination relations connecting the content contents of a and b that is sufficient for a to metaphysically explain b but the fiction is superfluous we can just say that a metaphysically explains b remaining neutral about the kind of metaphysical determination at work without having to talk in long disjunctions furthermore further we do not need to talk about the system of metaphysical explanation we impose on these relations we need only apply it okay so they're just saying all right we already had a perfectly good fictional uh, or general term instead of grounds and calling the grounding fictional. Okay, but again, are we just defining ourselves out of the problem one more time? I think we might be, because now we've got metaphysically explains. What does that mean? It just means fictional grounding, or they are saying it can do all the work of it. Why do you prefer one over the other? I don't know. All right. Author says this last point is important because the other advantage Thompson attributes to the grounding fiction is that it allows us to communicate about determination relations while remaining neutral on whether explanation is a purely objective ontic affair. Why are we bringing ontic into this? All right. Directly asserting A metaphysically explains B no more takes a stance on this issue than does indirectly communi communicating like this, uh, you know, bracketed version via a grounding fiction. Both ultimately communicate that there is an objective metaphysical determination relation, relation in place and that this is sufficient for A to explain B. If explanation is fully objective, then what makes the presence of this relation sufficient for explaining for explanation has nothing to do with our perspective on the matter. If explanation is less than fully objective, then our perspective plays a role. But we need not settle this to literally we need not settle this to literally and truly assert a metaphysically explains b assuming it does just as we need not settle the matter of whether color is an object or feature of reality to literally and truly assert the sky is blue besides if one wishes to expunge all possibility of implicating matters less than fully objective then one can say a metaphysically determines b in place of a metaphysically explains b the grounding fiction has no claim to neutrality that cannot be easily that cannot be achieved easily without it okay so they're basically saying what more is being added by calling it a fiction i would just say maybe clarity and they're just building that into the definitions here but like is that really helpful maybe maybe they're saying look the, the idea that we're fooling ourselves by calling uh grounding uh more fundamental is just wrong we are still just talking metaphysical determination or metaphysical explanation and if that's right then they have a point Again, I'm not like an expert here, but it just seems like we're playing semantics a bit. The very fact that A metaphysically explains B is literal and direct. Excuse me. The very fact that A metaphysically explains B is literal and direct is a prima facie reason for prefer, to prefer using it in place of a less direct way ways of communicating, at least when doing metaphysics. See, this is the problem. If you're saying this is, uh. Like, 
is is literal and direct. Excuse me. I'm losing my mind. That you're saying A metaphysically explains B is literal and direct. The only people it's literal and direct to are people who are in this philosophical literature. And they would know the difference between metaphysically grounding and uh, metaphysical explanation. So is it really that much better here? I, I mean, I keep harping on this, but like this is what the author is claiming. Okay. Moreover, engaging in the grounding fiction raises difficulties that can be avoided by talking directly and literally. Here are the two I consider most pressing. Okay, so now we've got some content. What's wrong with grounding? First, the fiction in introduces unwanted ambiguity. Suppose I use A grounds B to non-literally to convey this uh, grounding relation that A metaphysically explains B in some sort of grounding way. My interlocutor re replies, A does not ground B. What does that mean? What do they mean? They could be speaking figuratively to convey the grounding does not actually work, in which case we disagree. Or they could be speaking literally to deny that A and B instantiate the grounding relation, in which case we do agree. Such ambiguities could be avoided by making explicit the spirit with which one is using grounding talk, but this is at best an unnecessary inconvenience. Okay, so yeah, introduce a new standard, you have more standards, it's a problem. Second, when engaging with the grounding fiction, certain non sequiturs may seem attractive. Suppose that the transitive metaphysical determination relation R and the non-transitive determination relation R star, so one's uh, transitive and one's non-transitive, R star is non-transitive, are each always sufficient for a metaphysical explanation. Suppose further that metaphysical explanation is not generally transitive. When A bears R to B and B bears R to C, we can infer that metaphysically that A metaphysically explains C. So that's the transitive one. When A bears R star to B and B bears R star to C, we cannot infer that A metaphysically explains C. Engaging with grounding fiction means that seeing R and R star as instances of the same determination relation, which may invite mistakes. If one is used to dealing with explanations backed by R, where it is fictional that A grounds C, if it is fictional that A grounds B and B grounds C, one may find analogous but invalid inferences back and backed by R star tempting. The problem is not that the inferences look alike, it's rather that the reasoning well that reasoning well about metaphysical explanation may require sensitivity to the differences between specific metaphysical determination relations, and pretending that they are instances of the same relation may make this more difficult. Yeah, this is uh <laughs> This is how metaphysics is going nowadays. I'm sorry about that. Alright, well we got finish up this paragraph then we got one more section and then we'll be basically done so it's good to go some realists about grounding believe that there are metaphysical explanations not backed by grounding grounding is typically thought to be the distinctive manner in which more fundamental portions of reality give rise to less fundamental portions of reality yet examples such as socrates is the very individual he is at least in part because he has so a uh, sophroniscus as a father are arguably metaphysical explanations where their explananda are no less fundamental than their explanands. Yeah, so like, are we really explaining anything by saying Socrates is the person he is because he had his father? It's all the same guy, really. If this is right, then my proposal will need to be finessed slightly. Instead of A grounds B, one would need to say A metaphysically explains B and A is more fundamental than B. Okay, so now, aha. So now they have to do the work of actually giving structure that the grounding relation was doing because the metaphysical explanation, there are different kinds of explanation here. This is admittedly more verbose, but verbosity is a price worth paying for a straightforward and linear man a literal manner of speaking that avoids the above problems. Okay, so basically they like their solution better because this is the structure. Real footage of the author in this paper, I mean... Is this safe to be played, I guess, if it's on YouTube? Let's see. Uh, what am I doing? Excellent. <laughs> yeah. So, that's kind of a... Uh, thank you, Vipers, for that uh, interlude. 
Yeah, this is the problem with uh, metaphysics. It's really navel gazing, and uh, I like metaphysics, but not this kind of metaphysics. Um, I mean, so but yeah. Again, what do we? What's the point? You need to have explanation. Why do we need to have explanation? Well, we have, we think certain things are more fundamental than other things. Then how do you do this generally? What is it to be explaining? Then you have these problems. You have to say, well, one, like we've abstract explanation, which is grounds, or you're saying metaphysical explanation, but then you have to sp specify the kind of explanation because there are different kinds of explanation. And so have we really solved anything here? Either you have the problem of the ambiguities that they were saying earlier with the grounding, or you have to then impose a structure when you talk about metaphysical explanation, which is what they're doing right here. So you have to add a structure, more fundamental structure when you're talking about explanations uh, only. So, and yeah, and then they even bite the bullet and say, and if you do things my way, we could still call it grounding. It's just you're using my theory. Again, if you're on the grounding side, then you, you get the structure, but then you have to be clear about something else. On this side, you could you lose the structure. You have to add that in again, but uh, you don't have the other ambiguity. So is, is this really better? Maybe because like it's, I don't know, maybe on the assumption that there is no grounding relation. There is no positive reason to engage with the fiction that there is and good reasons to avoid doing so. Revolutionary fictionalism about grounding is therefore unmotivated. Yeah. I mean, if they're right about that, this is simpler and less uh, prone to mistakes. It is better. But again, who knows? I don't know if I'd believe you on that. I mean, you never uh, jeopardized by TOS. That's fair. I was actually more worried. I shouldn't have said TOS. Um, I was worried about uh, copyright stuff. That's all. A Tindorius is paying. Oh, I got my grave somewhere in here lies a uh, Hanswurst. Oh, okay. Term used by Nietzsche. Interesting. I didn't know that. Okay. So this herm against hermeneutical fictionalism. Hermeneutical grounding fictionalism is the view that philosophers already speak non-literally when they utter grounding sentences. I mean, and this is fair. If we're talking about abstract explanation, or what, what do we really talk about? We don't know, but we like to structure it. Viper says, the problem with this stuff is that we understand it intuitively, but once we try to intellectualize it, it's like thinking about breathing. You can't do it anymore. But we try. Um, and e do people ever get anywhere with this stuff? Maybe. I mean, you have to look. Metaphysics is an extremely slow subject. We're still arguing about Aristotelian metaphysics, like Platonic metaphysics, all sorts of stuff from a long time ago. And like we do sort of like change our views on it, but it takes a lot of time and effort. And so looking at these like uh, stepwise things happening in the middle of a discussion, it doesn't look like anything's happening over long enough periods in human history. Yeah, we do actually get somewhere or it looks like we change our minds about metaphysics every so often. And so like, this is the thing when you're in the weeds, you don't really see it. So you're losing the uh, forest for the trees here. It's like, you're only seeing this like one tree and it doesn't look like we're going anywhere, but like we're in this giant forest and like you're traversing like tree after tree. So it's like kind of how metaphysics is. Okay. We have seen that when there are no obvious benefits to doing so, we have seen that there are no obvious benefits to doing so and some potential harms, but people may engage in unhelpful fictions. So the lack of utility of the fiction does not rule out hermeneutical fictionalism, though it does speak against it. How w might one motivate hermeneutical fictionalism without with a uh, hermeneutical fiction about grounding without appealing to the utility of the fiction? Direct linguistic evidence is not an option. There are no instances in the literature of theorists explicitly saying that they are that they are speaking non-literally, and those who are explicitly and those who explicitly reject the existence of the grounding re relation do not endorse the continued use of the term. I mean, yeah, when you say you're saying something that is you know is wrong, you're doing it because you think there's other benefits. But if there is no other benefits, then why are you saying it? There may be less direct evidence available, however. One is to argue that a non-literal interpretation provides a good explanation of otherwise puzzling features of the discourse. For example, Yablo points to features of our ordinary number talk that, according to him, are puzzling if we assume a literal interpretation such as, quote, impatience, people making statements purported 
to be about numbers are strangely indifferent to the question of their exi existence. Suppose that you that you as a math teacher tell Fred that what 2 and 3 add up to is 5. And suppose that some meddler points out that according to the oracle, which let us assume we all trust, everything is concrete and so not a number. Instead of calling Fred in to confess, confess your mistakes, you tell the meddler to bug off. If I possess, question, is it possible that some things belong in system one thinking while other things belong in system two? You don't get better at playing the piano or gain any more insight by thinking about what your fingers are doing. Um, you know, like, this is a metaphysical theory and how um, what is the relation of like thinking about one thing and doing something and like to something else like so is one thing actually related to the other like a system one and system two thing um like when you think about your fingers do you get better at playing the piano no um do you think about maybe in one instance like where your fingers are placed and how it feels like maybe you can change how you are like hitting a key once in a while and that like for that one piece of uh, music you want to hit a little bit harder so your finger bounces up or something um and maybe that would make you uh, gain some insight like your finger placement on the keys or something um but yeah to answer your question the simple answer is yes it seems like certain things are not about other things. And so you can only place it in system one system or system two. So you're thinking about like one thing, you know, as opposed to some other thing. So the simple answer is yes. But I mean, I just don't know because at the moment my brain's tried reading this and it's been too long. <laughs> so I have no good answer. But like that's the straightforward one. It's like how do you actually break down knowing how and like knowing what? Usually these things are separated like you know that something is true like you know you know that like this is where it's supposed to be but that's not how you play it um every so often there there will be overlap yeah sorry if i'm losing my mind at this point yeah i mean and to the author's point here it's like impatience like do you like if you know that everything exists has to have be like physically realized numbers don't count for some reason on that uh score it's like, well, when you're talking about addition, that doesn't matter. Like in some sense, okay. And so so the author says, such impatience is supposed to emerge in discourse we all agree is non-literal. Yeah, because there are no physical numbers, like in the sense that like that's what they are. For instance, if I claim to have a chip on my shoulder, I would have little time for any ensuing debate about the existence of the chip. Do philosophers engaged in grounding talk exhibit this kind of impatience when they are challenged by meddling eliminativists? They do not. Michael Raven takes Wilson Wilson's aforementioned challenge to grounding seriously and provides reason to think we should be optimistic about the existence of grounding in spite of it. Examples like this are hard to reconcile with the view that philosophers are doing anything other than speaking literally. Yeah, it's like, why would anyone talk about this if it was always false? Of course, mathematical realists have taken the claims of mathematical anti realists seriously as well, but at least enough to offer replies not charitably phrased as bug off. But this does not undermine hermeneutical fictionalism about mathematics. The key difference here is the target of the herme hermeneutic proposal. Hermeneutic mathematical fictionalism is a proposal about about what ordinary speakers, that is, the currently not in, those currently not engaged in the philosophy of mathematics, are doing when they assert sentences that appear to commit them to the existence of abstract mathematical objects. As such, realists who are explicitly arguing for the existence of mathematical objects or theorizing about their nature are not taken to be speaking figuratively by the proposal. Viper says, I just think that once it gets to his navel gazing gazing stuff it seems like it's analyzing stuff that we don't even need to think about because it just comes naturally to us without thinking maybe that's why it never gets anywhere because it belongs in that non-thinking space um or non-thinking i am still hungry i was actually thinking about popcorn sometimes i have popcorn after stream uh, so that's what i was thinking about i will say that um people have come in I, it wasn't tindarius no i think it was nintendo PharmaCon or somebody came in and asked actually about um mathematical fictionalism once uh, not that long ago. And so right here we had a 
because like they study some math i think and so this is like a philosophy of math i've had questions on philosophy of math before and so this is not tenderos yeah it's nintendo pharmacon i think um so this is like even though like you might not like this one pack like this paper and i agree this paper is a lot of navel gazing it, we just in this paragraph which you were probably typing out your paragraph before i got to it this one paragraph is like something i have been straight up asked on stream so ah nintendo Farmer, i did sorry to call you out of lurk i did not know you're here i don't have that up but like this is the exact sort of thing that um like people have asked like nintendo has asked what is uh is math real and like so are we taught when we talk about math stuff are we talking about it fit like as if it's not entire uh, entirely true and this is one of the theories that do, do it hermeneutic fictionalism we are talking about something in a non uh true way but we do it because the math itself is what we're interested in not whether or not it is grounded in or not grounded but uh sorry about the grounding talk but whether or not it uh exists in like physical reality but like that doesn't matter um it doesn't matter because you're not interested in whether the numbers, their existence is it exists physically. You're interested in the relationship between them. Hey, Rethius, what's up? How you doing? Doing okay. Uh, we did philosophy roulette 400, and this is 401 tonight. So we got past the 400th paper, or like or philosophical thing, but mostly papers uh, analyzed on philosophy roulette. So that's kind of exciting. Um, yeah. And we're just talking a little bit about uh, mathematical realism here. You just watched a video where a person compared fascism in society to cancer, was, which was interesting. I mean, how? I mean, what, are they like uh, metastasizing? Like, what is the uh, what is the comparison there? Because I mean, there are one's a political thing and one's a uh, biological thing. But yeah. Um, you could drop it in Discord, maybe. I cannot watch it right now. Like, I'm getting... My voice is starting to go, and we only got two more pages of this, so I'd like to get this done, actually. So, if you want to drop it in this Discord, I can take a look at it later, but I can't do it now. Um, yeah. <coughs> I, got, I gotta love Twitch. Oh, thank you, for uh, Vipers, for that. Uh, the link. It's uh, I can see like four people chatting and it says one person's here. So yeah. Oh, is the biological aspect of the cancer we have to attack it? You can't ignore it once it happens. That makes sense because uh, certain things they just do build up on themselves. They don't seem to die out on their own. Uh, you know, some certain things like you know they undermine themselves and they just kind of die off. But a lot of like this political sort of unrest just keeps building on itself. So that does make some sense. All right, and getting back to the uh, mathematical fictionalism thing. Uh, expansion of Dawkins' mimetic theory. That's kind of cool. Yeah, so fascism does a good job with uh, memes. That's interesting. <sighs> yeah. So, like, why are we talking about uh, math if it's fake? Well, if, if it, like, our speech is technically false, it's because we're interested in the relationships, not whether the relationships have physical realization in the world. But that's, yeah, but that's what the uh, Schaffer, I think, was talking about a few weeks, when we were talking about this a few weeks back. Do they, are they real? Sure, but how are they real? And it's more that we're more concerned with the reality of their relationships to each other than they are to, like, being uh, physically realized in the uh, world. Okay. Author continues, in contrast, hermeneutic grounding fictionalism gets targets philosophers who appear to be arguing explicitly for the existence of the grounding relationship relation eh, relation and theorizing about its nature the fact that these philosophers take meddling and limitivist seriously is if we're damning evidence against a non-literal interpretation okay yeah so it's people who care about math they don't care if you say well there are no uh numbers in like physical reality people who are talking about grounding they get insulted <laughs> because they have nothing else to talk about and that's kind of a funny argument here. It's that the fact that the the grounding people get insulted by this, it's because they don't have anything else to talk about. So when you call them out on their bullshit, they get uh, nervous. <laughs> okay. 
Yeah. One might object that grounding talk in philosophy is not limited to grounding theory. For example, some physicalists express their view by saying that all mental facts are grounded in physical facts. All right, so we're moving from um, the mathematical reality to mental reality. Mental facts are grounded in a... <laughs> no, there is no grounding for grammar in reality or money. Humans are good at this? No, uh, that's agreed. Although, Rethius, there is an argument that says logic and grammar are somehow aligned. Um, that logic does reflect grammar in some way or the other way around. So it may not be in our actual reality, but in some very abstract uh, structure of how we structure things, then maybe. So grammar and logic can be aligned, but that doesn't actually tell you much about the world. Yes. But, like, you have to keep it... Oh, absolutely, Rethius. There are many grammars as there are languages, but there are only so many ways people have uh, constructed logic. Now, they've done a lot of different things, but most of them, you can show equivalences between them. So the logics tend to be uh, somewhat... Uh, you can relate... That You can, like, relate structure to them. Yeah, no, that's actually a fun... St uh, that's actually fun where people are, you know, showing uh, logics are equivalent. There's a lot like these very uh, abstract structures that you can then start plugging in. Like this logic is like this structure with this property and then all that sort of stuff. And so, you know, there's a lot of times uh, logicians are concerned with what logic re reduces to what other logic. Because once you understand that like uh, an un what you thought was an unusual logic has certain properties of other logics, then all of a sudden you start, oh, okay, it's more like this with this property and you can like talk about it. No, no, distracting is fine. And this is what we're talking about here is like what is actually uh, metaphysically explains another thing. And so it's like, well, what is explaining... Um, like uh, logic and language together, it's that there's a lot of these interrelated things. Viper says, I've often wondered if machine learning could analyze natural language and make most efficient language possible. Um, the fact that language is always changing, natural language that is, it would be very hard, I think, for it to make it more efficient than it already is because we're discussing so many new things in uh, natural language that machine learning could process it, but it would always be you know, it always have to take its own output and like re like recycling that because that output that it output would then interact with people again. So I don't think that like um, that'd be a particularly <laughs> fruitful enterprise. I bet it was the Tuscan Raiders and Star Wars speak. I don't know enough about Star Wars to comment on that. Okay. <sighs> Okay, so if some physicalists express their view by saying that all mental facts are grounded in physical facts. Oh, you're, you're thinking could like it simplify logic. Syntax changes a lot than semantics, but I'm talking about structure with rare, which rarely changes. Okay, so like some abstract logical or uh, grammatical structure. Um, linguists do this all the time. I mean, I, I think... Uh, <laughs> I'm sure it was Rethius. Uh, you'd have to go. I'd have to know more about the linguistics literature. But I, Vipers, I, I'd be shocked if no one was doing, like, was looking at that sort of thing in the linguistics literature. How to uh, give an abstract stru structure to, you know, many languages. I know I've seen some of it, but I really don't know enough philosophy of language and linguistics to get into that specific topic. But I can guarantee you, people have looked at that. <clears throat> okay, so yeah. So, for some physicalists express their view by saying that all mental facts are grounded in physical facts, would such philosophers act with impatience if confronted by a meddling and limitivist? As far as I know, there is no textual evidence to decide this matter. Yeah, like, no one's saying, well, it doesn't matter if they are. It, no, that's not the point of, like, saying, uh, if you think that the mind reduces to the brain. If, you're, if someone says, well, there are no thoughts. It's like, no, that doesn't matter. That's not what we're talking about here. Or not that there are no thoughts, but that's not how it works. It's like, no, that doesn't matter. We're talking about, like, the mind-brain relation. So, like, no one cares if uh, someone says, I disagree. It's like, no, we're still talking about the minds and brains. Yeah. Okay. But even if philosophers outside grounding theory were to exhibit impatient when, impatience when challenged by grounding eliminativists, there are other more charitable ways to explain this phenomenon. Perhaps they don't find eliminativism to be a tenable position, or they don't buy into the assumption that grounding is a distinct ontological posit in the first place. In light of these options, a non-literal interpretation seems perverse, particularly given the availability of the direct and literal in 
locutions metaphysically explains and metaphysically determines. Hey, the poetry reader, how you been? You know, oh, Tropical Geek uh, was uh, sent me over to the poetry reader, and I know you're, uh, oh, you Diamond E recommended you check it out. Cool, cool. Yeah, poetry reader is a uh, philosophy streamer. And so, let's give poetry a shout out to all the other folks here. So, if you're watching this uh, here or later on the YouTubes, the Poetry Reader is now streaming um, uh, philosophy over on the Poetry Reader, uh, twitch.tv slash the Poetry Reader. They were reading some Plato, I think, last time I saw them doing philosophy, and then they were also playing. Count, uh, not, I was lurking you while you were doing some. Uh, what's that thing at the bottom of the sea? That's what happens. I start losing words. Uh, stabbing yourself. Yeah. Well, oh, that game. <laughs> Very famous game. <laughs> um, but yeah, so if you haven't if you haven't checked out the Poetry Reader, he does some uh, philosophy streaming, so give him a follow if you don't mind. And uh, yeah, thanks for stopping by. We're just fish I just grab what I do here is um I grab random papers, I read them, try to explain them. Sometimes they're more painful than others, that's why it's, it's the program's called Philosophy Roulette <laughs> because <laughs> I don't know what I'm going to land on. Um, but yeah, as you can see, this is episode 401. 400 uh, philosophy things analyzed. Yeah. So the author here is just falling back on their thing. Says, hey, look. Everyone who's talking in philosophy thinks they're doing something for real. No one's thinking they're lying except in very special circumstances. And if you're talking about grounding, you're still not doing that in the special circumstances. So you shouldn't do it, be doing it in grounding anyway. All right. So now they say, one could also object that non-philosophers engage in grounding talk when they use locutions such as in virtue of, because, gives rise to, and so on, and that hermeneutic fictionalism about grounding should instead target these utterances, but the resulting position wouldn't be particularly interesting or plausible. Yeah, I mean, people say, look, they use the word because all the time, and it's a non-causal explanation. It's like, you know, why is this, why is this pencil a pencil? Because it is. Like, I mean, that's all it is. That's what, that's what it is. That's a non-causal explanation because it is. Boom. That's it. But like then, is that a fiction? Would you call that a fiction? No. Poetry Reader says, cool stuff. I'm going through Dietrich von Hildebrand's book, Transformation in Christ for my January book right now. Philosophy-ish. Sounds good. I mean, there's also some like, uh, that sounds a little religious -y, which is fine too. So yeah, get a little, the, uh, no, you can keep, dude. Do, uh, I don't mind getting distracted. Some, <laughs> so that's all. But yeah, theology is cool too. We sometimes uh, I do some more. Uh, I like throwing in some comparative comparative philosophy papers. So you know, I'll read something from like philosophy East West or whatever, or from comparative philosophy. So we're reading about you know Chinese uh, Confucianism every so often, and then you can see like you know different religions. We got some Buddhist philosophy I've done before, and uh, yeah. So, yeah, feel free to interrupt. As always, this is my first time reading this paper. If you have questions, want me to talk about something, let me know about the paper or not. So, yeah, thanks for stopping by. I appreciate it. Okay, so, yeah, but, like, again, when someone says, like, is this, this pencil is a pencil, and you're, so it's a non-causal explanation. It is what it is just because that's how it is. It's not, nothing's causing it to be that. That's just what it is. But, again, is that a fiction? No. Why would that be? No one's doing that. They just want to say that's what it is because that's how it is. So author says it wouldn't be plausible because even if these scattered uses of related expressions are systematic enough to warrant a common interpretation, it is unlikely that an adequate interpretation that an adequate interpretation will be one on which ordinary speakers are exploiting a fiction resembling the re received view about grounding. Yeah. Why would someone be knowingly saying something false? If ordinary speakers use locutions like in virtue of to convey things about metaphysical explanation, why not take such locutions to literally and directly express things about metaphysical explanation? With this straightforward option available, a fictionalist interpretation seems perverse. Yeah, you don't accuse people of doing like fancy philosophy stuff. Like, why would you? It's mostly pointless. Okay. 
Author says, it wouldn't be interesting because the case for realism about grounding doesn't rest on the fruitfulness of folk locutions, but rather on the fruitfulness of the application of the regimented philosophical notion of grounding to metaphysical theory. Even if hermeneutical fictionalism about folk notions of grounding were plausible, this would bear little resemblance to the debate between realism and limitivism about the philosophical notion. Yeah. And even if people, that's the saying basically, yeah, why would you look at what ordinary people are doing when we're talking about some highly technical flo uh, philosophical debate? It's uh, Even if it was close, you'd have to make a really strong claim that the fancy philosophy was actually uh, parallel paralleling the uh, folk or just what everybody people are saying, and that's not what's going on here. Okay. Author says, another way to motivate hermeneutical hermeneutic fictionalism is to appeal to a principle of charity. One might think that when interpreting the speech or behavior of a population, we should avoid attributing error or irrationality to them. On this view, assuming there is no grounding relation, we should avoid interpreting philosophers as expressing belief in the grounding relation. The, the kind of charity at stake here involves interpreting someone's linguistic behavior in a way that maximizes the number of their beliefs that are in agreement with our own and so true by our account. Viper said, I still don't know if I resist this topic because it's dumb or because me, you, it makes me feel like a schmendrick. Um, I'd say basically that this topic should be avoided unless you're very much interested in this. And you only get interested in this if you have a, a lot of background here. There's no real reason to talk about this. This is just more, this is mostly navel gazing, but uh, in the long run, this might like pay off to know what is the best terminology to use. But like, you're not dumb, but you also aren't going to have enough like, uh, you're not going to be like this if you dealt with this stuff every day in and out then you'd care but like no one deals with this stuff it's like not worth it this is uh basically just you know inside baseball as it were it's like do you care about like all the little details about how everything works no this is trying to figure out little details here which is fine if you're a professional philosopher it's not fine if you're trying to learn something about like metaphysical explanation this is more about what not to do and uh, that's unfortunate. I was hoping it'd be more about fictionalism, and it's more about not being a fictionalist because it's what's not to do. Which is, I was, you know, hoping there'd be fun things more about the uh, mathematical fictionalism, like because that's what I've had questions on before. People are interested. How do we talk about math when it doesn't exist, like in physical reality? All right. Applied to grounding talk, such a principle can be meta semantic. Uh, concerning what makes it the case that a linguistic interpretation of a population is the correct, correct one or ethical concerning what it takes to respect one's interlocutors as a competent epistemic agent. Yeah, so maybe you have to say what their view is not exactly. If you're talking about people you don't really know, how do you deal with them? Well, you say, look, you have to translate their concepts into your concepts. And so what they're saying may not be strictly right, but you have to understand at a meta semantic level how to like get away from what you consider their mistakes and what you mean, what is the right way in the sense that what you mean by these things, you understand how it makes sense. Okay. Author says, it has already been said that even if we interpret speakers so that they are right about as many things as possible, that does not guarantee that they will be right about any particular sphere. I will show. I will further show that appealing to a principle of charity fails to support hermeneutic fictionalism in the particular sphere of grounding talk. Understood as. <clears throat> oh wow, losing it. Yeah, my voice just decided to cut out for a sec. <sighs> Understood as an ethical principle, like yeah, if you're trying to ethically do right by people. Charity is inappropriate when applied to grounding talk. When a metaphysician offers an argument for taking a portion of real reality to be a certain way, they do so in perfect awareness that they may err. They offer, they offer reasons for their position and ask that we, for, that we give them due consideration. And this happens actually, like, to be fair to metaphysicians, they know they're wrong a lot of times. And they say, look, this is the best we can do. Metaphysics is hard. You have to uh, begrudge me a, pin a pinch of salt, as is the famous uh, line from Frego. If we find them unconvincing and have reasons for adopting an op opposing position, we should conclude that our interlocutor, uh, interlocutor is in error and try to explain where they went wrong. To interpret our interlocutor instead so that they agree with us is patronizing. 
it fails to give their reasons due consideration and fails to countenance the possibility that we may be wrong and they may be right. The ethics of metaphysical debate, therefore, speak against hermeneutic fictionalism about grounding. Understood as a metasemantic principle, charity fails to single out a hermeneutic fictionalism about grounding talk as the correct interpretation, even if we grant that what metaphysi the metaphysicians often intend to convey when they utter grounding sentences are propositions about what metaphysically, what metaphysically explains what. If propositions about uh, eh, excuse me, I'm losing. If propositions of the form A grounds B are false, that's A grounds B in the grounding sense, are false but often have true propositions about metaphysical explanation associated with them, then charity seems to favor an interpretation of grounding talk on which A grounds B literally means the proposition that A metaphysically explains B. This is because it is likely that many grounding theorists believe that they are speaking literally when they are uttering grounding claims. On hermeneutic fictionalism, these beliefs are false. On the alternative proposal just outlined, they are true. The metasemantics of the grounding debate therefore speak against hermeneutic fictionalism. Yeah, so it's basically, this is what, this is funny though, actually. What they just said here is that like in the metasemantics, they just translated the grounding theory back into what they said the right theory was, which was their opinion from the stuff above. So it's like, yeah, OK, so if you're going to say, oh, we're going to we're going to translate your grounding stuff into this into the right theory well they just translated it into their theory which they said you could go back and forth given appropriate changes but they said mine's just cleaner and so that's what they just did right here they said but why would you do that if you could just stick with the cleaner one to begin with okay Author uh, fin is finishing up. We have seen that there is no direct linguistic evidence in favor of a non-literal interpretation of grounding talk, and that more theoretical means of motivating such an interpretation speak against hermeneutic fictionalism rather in favor rather than in favor of it. I conclude that hermeneutic grounding fictionalism is unmotivated. Conclusions. I focused on Thompson's fictionalist proposal about grounding and shown that it is unmotivated. Perhaps there is another development of grounding fictionalism that will avoid my objections, but I cannot think of one. As things stand, I suggest eliminativists should stand by their abandonment of grounding talk. <sighs> okay. Thank you all for being here. Thank you all for uh, sticking this one out with me. I know the other one, my, the first paper was a little bit more uh, engaging. This one was a little bit more academic navel gazing, which is okay. Um, anyone have anything else to say about this? I was hoping that we would talk more about um, a, a mathematical fictionalism and like some of the other stuff we briefly touched on uh, about language also. But uh, yeah, I, I mostly agree uh, vi with Vipers here avoid grounding if you can it's really uh i know some people like it a lot of people made hay out of it in like little careers in the last 20 years off this stuff but um it's it's never been uh my favorite and i know you know it's okay people like it get what you can out of it but it's like how much are you really getting out of uh, abstract theories of explanation how much can you talk about the world other than just you know what explains what is how you try to understand the different kinds of explanation. But people know a lot of different kinds of explanation. There's a lot long history of explanation. Are we really getting anywhere by giving a single unified um, theory of grounding that is somehow you're going to have to just make very complicated to uh, cover all the different kinds of explanation there are? Or could you just stick with the explanations as was said before and, you know, maybe use grounding as a shorthand every so often? <laughs>